in crisis, there's opportunities. So I see great potential coming from this, from the focus on bringing in other voices that should never have been left out anyway. What happens when you dig deeper to find the real story? What's beyond the surface level and what others think should be told? But once you get past all of this, you start to uncover the real story, the one worth researching, writing, telling, and retelling. This art and practice is what makes for a legendary career as a writer, journalist, and author. This process is what Julian Guthrie has used all throughout her career. For more than 25 years, Julian Guthrie has been a Silicon Valley writer, journalist, author, and entrepreneur. She tells stories that need to be told, often when others refuse to investigate or explore them. She's a lover of words, language, and storytelling, with multiple nominations for the Pulitzer Prize. But most importantly, Julian is driven by an understanding that the right story and the right narration can open minds, change lives, and even jumpstart a movement. In this episode, Julian joins me to discuss her new book and movement, Alpha Girls. This book tells the tale of four women who, through diligence, grit, and determination, take on a male-dominated industry and forge their own way. We talk about the message and movement here, as well as some of Julian's other experiences, books, and learnings, especially the ones where she's profiled some of the most well-known and unknown entrepreneurs on the planet. So get ready to learn the unknown backstories of four women who have impacted Silicon Valley in meaningful ways. Let's jump into today's episode of Hidden in Plain Sight with Julian Guthrie. This season of Hidden in Plain Sight is brought to you exclusively by our friends at Splunk the data to everything platform. Splunk helps organizations worldwide turn data into doing. It's time for data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen. Learn more at splunk.com or by clicking the link in our show notes. Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Super happy to be talking with you. Right back at you. So I'm a fan of your work. And what I think is interesting about your work and your perspective is that it's a multi-decade one. So you've been a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle for uh, 20 years, um, maybe longer now, you can correct me, but I'd love to start there and just get your take on, you know, what was going on when you originally joined the Chronicle and, you know, hear a little bit about your evolution as a writer. So I left the newspaper after 20 years. I left, I don't know, about three or four years ago. And I had an amazing career as a journalist. I loved it. It really set the groundwork for what I'm doing today. It led to books and then it led me now to um, founding a startup. But I started when there were cities were multiple newspaper towns um, and there was actually a print paper that you know most people um, subscribe to. And so it was a different era and it was really competitive in terms of, you know, there was the afternoon paper, the examiner, and the morning paper, The Chronicle, and we were super competitive with one another for stories, which was really fun, high adrenaline. Um, but I just remember starting and I was so inexperienced and I would get these, um, I would get assignments and I would have say five days to complete something. And I would be so nervous about that because, oh my God, how am I gonna go out and report and write a story in five days? And, um, and then I started getting the hang of it. And then it would be an assignment in three days and then two days. And then it would be like Guthrie. Okay. The story is due. I'd come in that morning. And then the story would be due at, you know, four o'clock that afternoon. And I just started really advancing my skills and loving, you know, working on deadlines. And it was just a great team at the, at the newspaper, a lot of characters and um, a lot of eccentrics, a lot of super talented people. And just to see the creativity that come that is behind a newspaper, you know, the daily assignments, you know, on the photography side and the design side and the business side and the editorial side. Um, it was a an amazing, amazing time. And it changed my view of the world. Um, it gave me great skills um, to tell stories in different mediums. And it was just a privilege to walk into so many different worlds and so many different lives and to see how people live. And it gave me a great sense of empathy as well. So I'd be curious to dive into the creative uh, constraints that come with when you're writing on such tight deadlines where you have competition from other newspapers, 
and you know, you're in the back channels trying to get information or get tips on a story. Um, did you find that working with those constraints uh, really helped your writing later on, or was it an invaluable experience? Um, what's, you know, what's your take on those constraints? Because I think for creatives and founders, it's uh, so important to surround ourselves with the right pressures, the right constraints. I am. Um, it's interesting. That's a great question. You know, constraints to me were motivators and I loved almost having a limited period of time. Um, you know, one thing that artists do or creators do is um, if you don't have a deadline, it's just, you know, it will go on forever. And one blessing that comes with deadlines is that it's finite. Your time is finite and you have so many hours. You know, it was also a time when journalism was very different. Journalism was much less biased than it is today, or I shouldn't say biased, but less opinion driven. And it was very much present both sides to the story um, and leave your opinion and your own. You can have your voice in there, but leave your opinion out. I studied a lot of writers who and reporters um, who I really admired, uh, like Rick Bragg, Maureen Dowd, Oriana Falacci, who brought a very strong voice and narrative voice, almost novelistic voice into, um, into their journalism. And so I studied that. And the constraints to me were life-changing, life-enhancing in that now when I write a book, I can time it to, you know, if the book is due nine months out, I literally have this sense, and I don't even have to map it out on a calendar, of when I need to finish my reporting, when I need to start my writing, when I need to start the revisions. So having those really strict deadlines was a great gift, actually. And it's fun. You know, it's fun to challenge yourself. Like, how much can you do? And I love the adrenaline. Um, I love the competition. I feel like competition is a great thing. You do your best. You try to do better. Um, each day you let the, um, those who are super talented you know, let them challenge you, let them motivate you to do better. So for me, it was, I was really well suited for it. And um, I learned a great deal and it set me on this path today where, where a good thing is, is that I'm very responsive to deadlines. The less good thing is that I rely on deadlines to do anything. <laughs> so if I don't have one, it's, uh, it's not so good. That's right. Work expands uh, without them. So uh, I would love to jump into Alpha Girls and the movement and the company and everything that's come uh, from this book. I think what's interesting about books is trying to find the origin or find, you know, where did the initial inspiration start from? So uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one of the interesting parts of the acknowledgement referenced your mother. And I thought it was very interesting how she uh, was, you know, very involved in sports and she returned to the golf circuit after uh, decades of taking time off. So if you wouldn't mind, let's start with your mother and maybe some of the earliest inspirations um, you found in Alpha Women. You're going to bring tears to my eyes every time I talk about my mom, who's like my best friend, and she thankfully is with us today. But, um, you know, you, I, I heard my mom's story and um, I didn't necessarily appreciate it when I was growing up. But when I was writing Alpha Girls, I began to think about all of the women around us who are these everyday heroes, you know, they could be your mother, your sister, your peer, your, your partner, um, your boss, but who uh, do really incredible things. And for whatever reason, and I could go into this for a whole hour, um, women's stories are just not told at the same rate that men's stories are told and have not been historically. And the numbers are pretty extreme and pretty egregious. I went back and I talked to my mom about her early days. She was the first woman to be offered a full scholarship at Gonzaga University in, in Spokane, um, specifically to play on the men's golf team. And she was, um, you know, she was Grace Kelly gorgeous. And she was, that's kind of an aside. I just say that as a proud daughter. And uh, she was an amazing um, athlete and, um, and golfer. And she was uh, on the men's team. She'd already won state championships. Um, many, many states, and um, she was disallowed from participating, and it was the governing body of sports at the time, I should say, that there were no co women's college athletic teams. So then the governing body of college sports uh, weighed in, and there were a few women across the country who were playing on the men's teams because there were not women's teams. So what do you do, right? 
And so she was stopped from, from being a part of that and she could no longer play on the men's team. And she then went and she did a number of things and had a big family, And uh, but she always wanted to return to golf. And as you said, she returned decades later, um, determined to again get to um, the top in this sport. And she went on to win, um, you know, she, I remember seeing her out there and she would come home with, you know, calluses and, bloody hands and from like hours and hours and hours of practicing. And anyway, she would go on to uh, become the top national amateur golfer, woman golfer in the country and win huge, huge titles and is in the Golf Hall of Fame. So that was a real inspiration. And her story, I think, is reflected in so many stories in these women who are in our lives. And one of the things with Alpha Girls that I've loved is just hearing so many stories of um, trailblazing women who have lived until now very anonymously and their stories have been untold. So, and it was going back, the inspiration for Alpha Girls was really, it came from my last book, How to Make a Spaceship, um, which was about Peter Diamandis and this great story of this, you know, this boy's dream of getting to space without the government's help uh, when there was no commercial space industry. And, uh, but it was going around with Peter and talking to groups of entrepreneurs and scientists and rocket scientists and space geeks. I say that very favorably. I'm one now, but it was seeing these big audiences largely of men. And I was like, where are all the women, you know, in these super cool industries that make, uh, have a big impact on how we all live. And so that's what led me to find this group of women in venture capital and in tech. You know, the story of women in tech is much more, uh, is well known, you know, 50, around 15% of the um, executive positions across tech industries at most are held by women. Uh, so we know that's a problem, but I wanted to go into kind of a, a niche um, and I, I selected uh, venture capitalists as this group that has really an outsized influence on how we all live, but it's a little known industry outside of certain circles. So, and when I started my reporting, I learned that 94% of all check writing VCs are men. Uh, only 2% of venture capital dollars go to women founded firms. And I thought that is crazy, uh, but let's look at who are the women who succeeded? Who are the 6%, right? How did they do it? What companies did they found? What was it like for them? How do their stories uh, resonate? Or how do their stories parallel with women trying to succeed in other male-dominated industries everywhere? So that's what led me to Alpha Girls. And it's just been just such a mind-expanding project, movement, gift to me. The four women that you profiled are fascinating, but I think what's really interesting too is that you present a holistic view of their struggles, everything from company building, um, being an operator, being a VC, but also you know battling cancer, going through um, marriage, divorce, raising children, uh, the whole spectrum there. And at the end, it's you know you say it's just the start of their story; it's just the beginning, which I I really like because you know we have multiple acts across life. And um, we live in a world that's very much, um, you know, against late bloomers. There's not a lot of celebration of that. So it was just this, uh, yeah, really fun read throughout their stories. And um, so let's just start with each of these women and kind of dive into um, their unknown stories, which I think are fascinating. So um, Magdalena is the first one. I don't know if I'm butchering the pr pronunciation, but. Yes, Magdalena Yishiel. So um I love all of these stories. I mean, they're also so cinematic. And I remember moments when we were, when I was reporting the story and I was like, oh my gosh, that's such a beautiful, beautiful, powerful story. Magdalena Yashil uh, was, she came to America from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, she had, you know, very few, she had, you know, less than I think $50, I forget the exact amount now, and nine gold bracelets she could sell if needed. She arrives at Stanford, knowing no one, having no job. Um, she ends up, uh, you know, she works the night shift in the computer lab. There's a really fun story there. Um, I think that is actually the opening, part of the opening of the book. And she's this free spirit in a way. And she becomes, as I said, an electrical engineer. She joins a semiconductor uh, chips company and she makes her way eventually to uh, becoming an entrepreneur. 
and having some success and some failure uh, kind of fits and starts, but having enough, enough success that she starts meeting real connectors in, um, and entrepreneurs, amazing entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And one of those is a man named Mark Benioff, who she, he was at Oracle and she was, um, she had her own company, which Oracle, Mark was the point person at Oracle. They used some of, um, some of the things that her company offered. And so Magdalena will go on uh, to become the first outside investor and board member of Mark's little company called Salesforce.com. Magdalena played a really key role in that and uh, in, you know, kind of saving the company in the early dot-com, uh, well, from dot-com to dot-bust, uh, dot-com, you know, when that went bust in the early 2000s. And she played a very significant role in that company. And her story had largely been untold. That's just one example. And she solved the cash flow challenges. One quick aside, solving the cash flow challenges of any business is, uh, you know, what's going to keep it going. And that was one of my favorite parts of the book. And um, because, you know, founders can be stubborn. And I think that that, you know, back and forth with Benioff is so fascinating because it sounds obvious, but um, in retrospect, had they not shifted all their contracts, how they did and, you know, salesperson compensation, there were, might not be a sales force. So, um, yeah, didn't mean to interrupt you, but MJ. No, that's, that's exactly right. And she, you know, she had two kids at home and she had a full-time job at the time she was working as a venture capitalist, but she stayed up night after night crunching the numbers on um, how they could change their, uh, their billing model. And everybody was really against it because software as a service, it was like pay by the drink. We're not going to bill customers, you know, a year in advance. We're going to charge them for only what they use right now. And that financial model was crushing them during when the economy turned and when so many of their customers were small businesses and startups. Um, so it was, it was definitely a turning point. And uh, Magdalena is on her, I think, fourth startup today. She sits on the number, a number of public boards. She is, uh, is a great entrepreneur and innovator and, and uh, just a great character. I mean, from a writer's standpoint, I mean, I love her. She's wonderful. But from a writer's standpoint, her, her journey going from Istanbul, Turkey, um, to where her life will take her is something that's really compelling and that's relatable to, you know, to the story of immigrants and the potential of what can happen uh, when you apply yourself in, in the right way. So um, the three others um, are MJ Elmore, who is the opening scene of the book. And I love this. She was a girl from Indiana who came from a very economically challenged sort of uh, stable, but um, really wonderful parents, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, she drives west in this Ford Pinto. And there's that opening scene in the book where she um, is driving and, and the, the floorboards of the Pinto were so, she was so, it was, it was so old, the car and the floorboards were rusted out. And she arrives in California, Northern California, and she takes the exit for famed Sand Hill Road, which is, you know, of course, the Mecca for entrepreneurs and VCs. And she can literally see the road rushing by below as she takes that exit. And when she told me that story, I was like, ooh, that has to be the opening of the book because that so reflects like, you know, where you start out with dreams and where you go on your journey. And I love that as a writer and a storyteller. So she'll go on to, she attends, uh, she'll work at Intel in the early days of Intel and uh, her, you know, there are lots of interesting stories there. And then she gets her MBA at Stanford. And out of that, she goes and becomes, uh, she's, she joins a venture uh, capital firm, Institutional Venture Partners, and she goes to interview with the founder and her Stanford classmates, you know, tell her before she goes off uh, to take this interview, they're like, Read Dennis. Why are you even going? Read Dennis is not going to hire a woman. And this was nothing personal about Reed. It was just more of an industry thing. Reed is, you know, is a is one of these great allies. But she went anyway. She thought, well, I'll go anyway and see where it leads, and it'll be informational. So she goes and she interviews and she gets an offer that day, and she will go on to become one of the first women in the United States to make partner to VC firm and really help 
fund and mentor some of the, you know, the key early software companies. Um, so her story is really, really wonderful. It's also, you know, with all these women, as you said, there's the personal story too. There's the, what happens when you start adding on with um, husband or partner with kids. MJ had three kids. Her husband was also a venture capitalist working full time. So how do you juggle those things? You know, it, all the questions around working, working parents, working moms, and how the burden at home is still largely on the mom even when both parents work the same amount. Um, so MJ's story is great. Then we had Sonia Perkins, who was from the South, and she, she's great. She get, they're all so different now that I think mm -hmm. about them. They're a beautiful tapestry. I mean, they're really interesting individually, but collectively they make a really neat, uh, a neat tapestry. So Sonia gets a job uh, first at TA Associates in Boston, and she loves venture capital. There's a fun scene early on where she's hired, and she it was three days or so after she was hired, and she begins uh, looking, for the first time, she's like looking around the office, is this beautiful wood paneled office, and she realizes she is the only woman there except for the support staff, and she starts to feel like, oh my God, was I, was I hired because I'm a woman? And, you know, I don't want to be a diversity hire, she thought. I don't want to be hired because of that. And she was kind of sulking around for a few days. And finally, you know, day six or day seven, she's like, snap out of it. I am here. I have earned my place. And I'm going to be amazing from here on, whatever the reasons for my being here. Um, and then she, she comes west, as all of these women do, and they land in, you know, Silicon Valley at different times. It was kind of an interesting challenge as a storyteller. Um, and she will join Menlo Ventures, and she has um, great, great uh, instincts when it comes to technology companies and a great ability to forge lasting relationships with auspicious or, or established entrepreneurs. And sometimes entrepreneurs who didn't uh, fit the, you know, the stereotype of an entrepreneur who came from different paths. She had phenomenal success. Um, her story is also, it gets very personal when she is diagnosed with very aggressive breast cancer at the very same time she's, she and her husband are adopting a baby. Literally the same two weeks, this all happens at once. And close to the time. Uh, around 2008 when the financial crisis is exactly. kicking off as well. So, yeah. And then, you know, and then what is it like when you go back and you're always sitting at the table with all men? These women, you know, were working in venture capital where they were the onlys uh, during this time. Now it's gotten better. It still needs to get up a lot better. They were the only woman. So then for Sonia, after she's been diagnosed, when she's, you know, when she's battling breast cancer, when she's having a baby, or adopting this baby, bringing her child into their lives. Um, and she goes back to you know, the, the venture firm and it's all men. And she, for the first time, feels really isolated and very alone. And she did not have a network of women at the time. You know, part of the beauty of this story is how these women created a network that didn't exist. And now they're offering that network to other women who are coming up through the industry. Um, and then the fourth, last but certainly not least, Teresa Gao, whose family came from Jakarta, Indonesia for that, you know, proverbial better life for the kids in America. And Teresa was, you know, we began this conversation talking about competition. Teresa was fiercely competitive in everything she did. She goes to Brown. She, you know, feels like a country bumpkin when she arrives, was totally overwhelmed, um, but will go on to graduate magna cum laude and comes to, comes west, arrives um, in Silicon Valley and has an amazing career. I mean, really fun to follow with hits and misses. You know, this is not just like an upward trajectory for these women. It's very real. Um, they made mistakes. They were with failed businesses or startups, or there were there were big downtimes. But then Teresa will join a venture capital firm, Excel, and have phenomenal successes, um, including Trulia, which was really one of the first real estate uh, companies to go online and some great entrepreneurs there, including Pete Flint um, and Sammy and Kinian. And, um, and then she played a role in landing Facebook, which of course was at the time 
uh, and probably still ranks as one of the top venture deals in history. I forget what the return was on their $12 million investment, but so Teresa played a role in that. And she, you know, in the book, she, yeah, there's, there are stories about Teresa and, and meeting Mark Zuckerberg and Sean Parker. And so there's great lore um, that has never been told where these women played a really key role in, in companies in bringing in major deals of companies that became game changers, something we use every day. Teresa was very successful, is very successful in cybersecurity companies, you know, find, landing the deal, financing, um, mentoring, um, sitting on boards. And, you know, and Teresa, again, the personal story, there was fallout there too. When you are a very powerful, successful woman, uh, you know, how does that play out in your relationship at home? And how does it play out uh, with your partner, with your spouse, with your kids? Who does what? What are the expectations uh, when you're working with all men and the men, let's say their spouses or their partners don't work? Uh, so there are all of these scenarios that I think women face and also men. I mean, I hope a lot of men read Alpha Girls because you see the world through women's eyes, but you also see um, a lot of great allies, you know, like Jim Getz, um, who's with Sequoia. He was a great ally to Teresa. And he, you know, he told her the locker room talk. He told her what the guys in the Valley were saying. He, um, he was always, you know, he was always telling her straight talk uh, what's going on. And I think, you know, it's kind of a, it's, it's great for men to, uh, to think about how they're supporting or promoting uh, or enabling uh, women at home and at work. And there's so many easy ways to do that. And, and there are a lot of great, I think there are a lot of great guys in the book. There are a few who didn't behave so well, um, but it's not a male versus female sort of story at all. It's, um, it's one that champions partnership and how these partnerships worked or didn't work. I mean, there was, you know, there, there, there was some bad behavior, but for the most part, um, there were men who were instrumental in really wonderful ways in these women's careers. And I love that too, because often the media will focus on the sensational bad behavior and then these real stories that require a lot of digging to unearth get left out. So it's been, uh, yeah, fascinating revisiting these. And I think with Teresa's story, uh, when she's at Excel, you know, she's there during a really tumultuous time. Several of the LPs, uh, high profile endowments of major universities are thinking about pulling out maybe, and she's able to win this deal by offering all kinds of insights into um, basically how Mark is thinking at the time. And, you know, she knows about his, his offer with Don Graham that's on the table, uh, as well as how he might be thinking about the recent Google deal. And that allows them to successfully win the Facebook deal, which, you know, propels Excel back up as, uh, you know, it's always been a premier VC firm, but it really reestablishes them. Um, I'm so curious, Julian, when you were going about collecting these stories and deciding which ones to feature, I'm sure you had uh, way more material that didn't, you know, get included in the book. Um, how did you go about like pruning these stories and deciding which ones you wanted to include uh, versus keep out? It is a little bit of a mystery, actually, how some stories come together. Like I, I had many more, there are many more women who had cameo appearances in the book or were secondary or tertiary characters. Um, but when I settled on these four, it was a bit of a gamble um, because I didn't fully know their narratives. You know, you start out and you have a proposal and you think you know what the story is, but there are always surprises. So I had a sense of the upward trajectory and I had a, a very superficial understanding of the challenges. And the challenges were something that I really needed to mine um, and that I really believed were instrumental to this story because nobody's career just goes one direction. Um, and I wanted to get into their personal lives. So the creative process was, it's just a really interesting thing. I mean, I, I didn't know how exactly, you know, how much they would give me in term and that was the biggest challenge i think of this book was getting the women to tell their personal stories and on many cases i had to write report around them um, to get information 
that then I would go back and I would say, I think it was a little more nuanced than this. So I wanted to talk about this. It was hard. It's really hard for, for women who are in this, who are going to be in the spotlight to be vulnerable. You know, these women have succeeded by being unflappable and by wearing this sort of Teflon suit where everything just, you know, runs off of them. And so asking them to revisit painful things or flawed times or uh, mistakes that they made maybe in a relationship uh, was really, really challenging. I don't know if that got right to your question, but, but it, was, it was a little bit of a mystery in terms of like how it all came together and why these women, because there were others that um, could have been, you know, and I've met so many alpha girls since the publication of the book, but I liked, you know, just as I was introducing the women earlier in this, in this conversation, you know, I liked the differences in, in age, in backgrounds, in ethnicity. Um, I liked the differences in um, their investing strategies and where they put their dollars and the types of companies they, be- they built, they helped build. So um, it really came together as, a, as I said, you know, where each, each woman stands on her own. Each woman is really, really interesting and compelling, but together, um, there's, I think there's, there's even more power in their story, in their differences, but yet in, you know, the things that they were, they were um, working to overcome and to achieve. You know, they had very shared dreams, and it's so interesting because they were working, you know, on Sand Hill Road or near Sand Hill Road, and for many years, you know, and they were maybe, you know, half a block away, but there were so few women and women were not seeking out the necessarily the companionship or networking with other women. You didn't want to stand out as a woman. You already did. So you wanted to fit in more with the team and the team happened to be guys. But for many years, these women, they were working so close to one another and they didn't, they didn't know the other existed. Yeah. And I think how this all kind of led to the formation of Broadway Angels and some of the funds that they've raised is uh, fascinating because, you know, we need the support of a network that gets us, that under, understands us. So tell us a little bit about how they kind of came together at the end of the story to form this group to help lift uh, everyone. So it was really Sonia in her time of crises, uh, crises uh, where she was facing this very aggressive cancer. She had a baby at home, you know, what she described as uniquely women, uh, female challenges. She had what she called a universal intervention. You know, the world kind of said to her, you need a network of women and that this is great. You love this industry. You love being a venture capitalist, but you have to create, you know, bring together women. And so she set about uh, founding a group of, of women investors. It's called Broadway Angels. And she, Magdalena, became uh, a co-founder of that, along with Jennifer Fonstad, who is also a VC. And they started to invite um, the most successful women VCs, the most successful women entrepreneurs uh, to be a part of this and to share deals, to network, and to create this kind of network that largely didn't exist at the time. And Teresa became a member of Broadway Angels and MJ as well. And so they all came together over this um, what they share, um, and then what we, and then what was missing. You know, they share a love of what they do, of launching, mentoring, funding, shaping next generation game changing companies. Um, but they also were lacking this network of women. You know, now there's All Rays, a group that is in Silicon Valley that is really doing a lot to bring more women uh, founders and funders to the table. Uh, but Broadway Angels is also a really just a wonderful organization and a uh, investment group. So individual women who pool their money and uh, make investments uh, big and small. And it's interesting because I cited the statistic of uh, only 2% of VC dollars go to women founded firms, which is crazy um, and is changing just slightly. But with both Teresa's firm, which is now called A Crew Capital, um, and with the last firm that she was running with Jennifer Fonstad, I think the number, the percentage of um, dollars going to women-founded firms was in the 40%, 40, 
with Teresa's and with Broadway Angels, it's, uh, I think it's over 50%, 50% of their dollars that they invest go to firms started by companies started by women. So it's, um, it's you know, and there, there's a proliferation, thankfully, of um, women founded VC firms as well. And it's just happening organically where now uh, more and more, you know, the numbers are still terribly low, but more women are getting, are getting funded and getting into venture capital. And I tell women of all ages, especially young women who are thinking about careers, that it's really a great industry to go into. Uh, it's super intellectually stimulating. Uh, it's almost like being a reporter in a way uh, where you're going into a different world and you're, you know, learning, processing information, assimilating it, listening to both sides, doing your own due diligence or reporting. And it's a place where you can make a lot of money and women need to make a lot more of the money out there. You know, and now there's now there's this network. So times have improved for women in venture capital um, and in tech and as founders, but we have a long way to go. I think this is going to be fascinating how it changed, changes the nature of what technology we create, right? Because for so long, it's been men that are, you know, imagining and creating these things. And we kind of have this world right now with technology and software and social media that's, um, you know, quite uh, addictive. And, you know, many of these products are you know pretty limiting. So it's going to be fascinating to see what type of technologies that women create over the, the long term here. Are, are there any um, you know speculations you have about how this will change the nature of technology creation? Um, how do you think this is going to change it in the future? Well, I think it's women, and then I think it's this call to social justice that we're all uh, that is top of mind right now. That uh, it all comes together where we need uh, we need much more diverse voices um, at the table. I mean, it's more fun, it's more interesting, it's more profitable. Uh, there's no question that corporations need to step it up and do better and uh, really across industries. So, you know, I think uh, that, you know, everything from, you know, increase in global GDP by having a more diverse uh, executive team and workforce, and that's something that is, uh, is very, very real that can happen and will happen. I think the product offerings um, whether it's software, whether it's in Hollywood, uh, whether it's this, you know, it's, it's the stories that are told. We need much more diverse input. And it's women, it's women of color, it's non-binary, it's um, men, women, uh, you know, really working together and listening to one another. And I think there need to be some better tools out there to kind of foster um, engagement. But so I, I see it as a possibly uh, you know, a really incredible creative time, you know, where we are in this convulsive period, if you will, but in crisis, there's opportunities. So I see great uh, potential coming from this, from the focus on bringing in other voices that should never have been left out anyway. I love that. So now things have kind of evolved from the book and you're starting a company. I would love to hear some about that. And why did you choose to do it? And tell us about it. So um, Alpha Girls, you know, opened my eyes and made me see the world differently. And in that way, again, it was a great gift. I saw where women are and where women are not and where women should be. And I was really struck and dismayed by, um, by the statistics of how women matriculate or do not and where they're the drop-off points. You know, why women are not getting to the C-suite, but why women are not getting to that first step up the ladder, why there's a 17% attrition from you know, the first job you have out of college or wherever uh, to the first managerial level. So what's happening? And I probably talked to 5,000, 6,000 people since the launch of, of Alpha Girls and talked to a ton of CEOs and corporations and um, stakeholders within companies at all levels and about what's working, what's not working, what are the diversity offerings, um, you know, and really studying those and seeing that a lot of what uh, we have out there in terms of the diversity offerings or training, it's ineffective, it's not working. I mean, all we have to do is look at the numbers to know that. There are, there are great people and there are some great programs, but using tools that are totally antiquated, um, both intellectually and 
uh, as a management structure. So I started to think, you know, in all my talks around Alpha Girls, I would always be asked the same thing. I would always be asked, how can they, what are the takeaways from these women? Like, how did they do it? What do they have in common? What are the traits they have in common? And then, you know, and how can this apply to my industry? And I would also get asked from men, how can I be a better ally? So I thought I need to kind of productize this and commodify it. There's a white space here in the market. And so I set about, I spent about a year creating this company that's called Mindset Alpha. And um, I'm just getting funding. I'm raising seed capital on that right now. And we're getting a lot of great attention. Um, but it's really to help. It's a, it's a B2B SaaS company that um, is about creating a platform for companies um, to better recruit, retain, support, and promote women within the ranks. And we also have a college pipeline and platform that connects to it. So I'm super excited about it. And anyone can, I, right now I'm doing a lot of talks where we're, we're trying to um, connect women one talk at a time and allies. We want to hear from men as well. Of course, we want you to be a part of this conversation and a part of the of improving things really. So it it feels it feels strangely like a continuum for me, like going from reporter to author to speaker to entrepreneur and founder, it doesn't feel like a disconnect. It feels very authentic to me to be in this place and to be able to use my reporting skills to listen to people, to get information, to bring a lot of people to the table. Um, to focus group, to talk with on, you know, talk with CEOs about what they're lacking, what they want to do, what they would bring within their company. So I think we can become where companies have a chief diversity officer. We can bring in um, all of our offerings and be huge value added. But something like 48% of U.S. companies offer no diversity programs uh, at all which is shocking, especially when you get out, you know, we're, when in the Bay Area, we think we take these things for granted, but elsewhere, you know, half of U.S. companies don't offer anything. So um, that's where we're going to step in and also just make it fun and inspiring and, you know, lots of micro learning. The world has moved online to remote learning. So how do we connect women during this time? Women are being disproportionately negatively impacted by the move toward remote work which seems to be here to stay for the foreseeable future. So how can my company step in and connect women and allies during this remote time? Very, very cool. And it'll be exciting to watch that uh, as it enters the world. Thank and you. I'm excited to see it. Uh, excited to help support too in any way that we can. Uh, so Julian, you have interviewed a number of different people from Silicon Valley. You've profiled people like Larry Ellison. Um, I've heard that you're friends with people like Elon Musk and you know him. When you have been in the process of like building your network, interviewing these folks and getting to know them, so many of them have this kind of caricature that where we think of them in a certain way. Um, are there any stories you can share or insights about, you know, the real humanity of these people outside of the image or, you know, what we think we know? Um, you know, they're always very different. And I will tell you while a couple of wildly different stories, like I feel like you that we all have expectations of what someone is like in my early days reporting i remember i interviewed this guy who was just out of pelican state uh, pelican bay state prison out of the security housing unit he was a leader of the mexican mafia you know he was um, allegedly a very very bad dude and i think he was in that world but i interviewed him and it was when pelican bay was having problems um with the security housing unit. And I interviewed him and I found him to be, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but I found him to be very polite and very gentlemanly. And I realized it's if you're in his world, in that gang life, you're in trouble. But if you're not, it's a whole different thing. So it was a change in my, it was like, oh my gosh, it was just this startling thing that I remember today. When I went to interview um, Elon Musk, I was very surprised at how soft, how soft spoken he is and very careful kind of as he thinks about his words and what he's going to say. Very articulate, very soft-spoken, very careful, you know, carefully choosing his words. And you would think like swashbuckler, you know, big booming voice, big presence. And uh, so that was surprising. And then I spent a year interviewing, a couple of years interviewing Larry Ellison and uh, found him to be, you know, some of the things, you know, the take no prisoners, the 
you know, the art of war, the swashbuckling, um, you know, leader that, uh, the caricature, as you said, that we have of Larry Ellison. You know, a few of those, tra those traits I would see, you know, kind of mercenary in business, uh, brilliant, but I also saw a side that was self-deprecating, which you would not expect because people think he's an egomaniac. And I didn't find that at all. I found someone who questions himself a lot um, or who asks a lot of questions about the world and doesn't have all of the answers, um, is always seeking answers, um, is funny as hell, like just a wild sense of humor where sometimes, I mean, we would just start laughing and very philosophical as well. Um, extremely well read, which of course I love, and a genuine reader, you know, a voracious reader. So, but again, someone who's always, who's questioning. And I think that's something you wouldn't necessarily expect. You would expect someone who doesn't ask a lot of questions, but who gives a lot of answers. He has a lot of answers, but he, I think he has even more questions. So just, you know, people are, um, I just feel like you have to walk into a room and you have to do your research and do your homework. Um, and of course, you're going to have expectations, but be completely open to um, who they will unveil themselves to be. And I think that's something where we have too seldom, which is walk in without judgment uh, and listen, you know, really listen. Storytelling is also about listening. So to really listen. So it's, you know, there are uh, many sides to all of us. And I think that, um, you know, getting to meet these super successful people, um, I hope that I've taken a little bit from, from each one of them. And I hope also that I portray people in, in a very honest way that has originality to it. I'm a big believer in storytelling and storytelling has the ability to open our eyes and change lives and galvanize industries. Completely agree. Uh, so thank you for being generous with your time. This is the final question. So this podcast is called Hidden in Plain Sight and we're always fascinated about you know, teasing out big trends or movements that are happening all around us right now. And I think this movement of alpha girls is one that's happening as we speak. It's happening all around the country. There are allies, there are people that are stepping out and saying, um, I'm down to help, just let me know how. And when it comes to that, you know, you mentioned you've been asked that a lot. Um, how does your answer change now? Or how do you answer that of, you know, there are a lot of people listening to this that say, I want to be better. I want to listen better. I want to be more thoughtful. Um, what would you say to them for all the people that want to get involved? I would say, uh, be look at the world a little bit differently. Look at the world from others' eyes. Try to have an open mind. Try to enter without, you know, a conversation without judgment. Try to truly listen and be constantly curious. I think when it comes to the stories of women and the advancement of women, I think we all play a role, and that is my absolute passion and ambition at this time. Um, that we all can play a role, whether it is, you know, telling more women's stories. You know, we started out by talking about my mom. So think about the, you know, the alpha girls, the amazing women in your life and tell their stories and celebrate them. And, you know, if you have a daughter, you know, teach her to be ambitious, teach her to take risks and also find women around who there's a saying, you can't be what you can't see. And let's start seeing more amazing women and girls in all of these different roles. So I think that, uh, you know, the world will be a more interesting place and the world will also be a more profitable place if we do just those things. Couldn't agree more. Julian, thank you so much for joining us and to everyone listening, we'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm Sophia Bush, and you've been listening to Hidden in Plain Sight from Mission.org. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Splunk, the data to everything platform. In today's data-driven world, every company, big or small, new or old, is sitting on terabytes of unused, untapped, and unknown data. Splunk helps turn all that data into action. Using cutting-edge AI and machine learning, Splunk delivers real-time predictive insights that will help you on your mission to change the world. With solutions for IT, security, Internet of Things, and business operations, Splunk empowers people to make faster, better decisions and take action to get things done. It's time for our data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things